You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. Hey guys, welcome back to Secret Sonics. I'm your host, Ben Wallach. This is episode 51 with Jonathan. But before I bring you that, I just wanted to give you a quick heads up that we discuss a lot of songs on his upcoming album. And I will leave a link to the secret sneak peek SoundCloud link that he sent me. So if you want to listen to that in accompaniment with this episode, that will probably bring a lot of clarity to a bunch of the stuff he's talking about. Uh, The other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I am conducting a listener survey and giving away a free one-hour production coaching call to one lucky winner. So if you want to fill out that survey and be eligible to win uh, a free call with me, please check out the show notes to this episode or just go to secretsonics.co and at the bottom of that page, you can find the survey. So please fill that out. And without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jonathan on Secret Sonics. Hello and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I'm your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Jonathan. John is a musician, songwriter, and producer based out of Charlottesville, Virginia. As a musician, John has played in Juniper Lane, Honor by August, No Second Troy, and has an upcoming record under the moniker Rotoscope. A phase music was forged in the production-oriented electronica scene in D.C., and with outside influences such as Brian Eno, Depeche Mode, and Portishead, his meticulous sound explorations evolve from their skeletal beginnings until they oscillate and brim with layers. Imagine Trent Reznor's film scores with an added focus on melody and songcraft. A uh, friend of the podcast, Sean Kelly, recommended I have John on the show, so it's an honor to have him on. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks, Ben. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, man. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Amazing. So, so tell me a bit about how you got started doing production stuff. I started doing production stuff probably about 20 years ago now. I had a Digi01 uh, Pro Tools rig running on an old Mac, and I would just kind of try and putting things together, putting pieces together. And uh, the the most amazing thing I got to do at that era of being a 20 year old trying things out was a friend of mine, Mario Sacasa, called and he's like, hey, I've got Nestor Torres here, who's a uh, Latin Grammy winning flautist. And he's like, and he's leaving tomorrow. And can you just record this stuff? And I'm like, dude, I'm I'm not that good. And he's like, yeah, you can figure it out. So I have this guy recording, like just going very quickly through these takes and I'm just trying to keep up with him. And all of a sudden it's, you know, at the end of it, he's like, that was awesome. Most people take so much time between takes. And I was just literally just like, yes, back, go next. Yes, back, go next. <laughs> um, like I just didn't, didn't want to mess it up. Right. And, um, and so that, totally. <laughs> that was like, I was like, Oh, okay. This is different than the norm, but, uh, that worked. It got on that record and, and that was really cool. Um, and from there I just, you know, I kept working with friends and, uh, in the DC music scene, in, at that era, there was a pretty good singer-songwriter group, and I've always been the guy that does the weird soundscapes around stuff, so I would have my volume swell, delay, kind of you know weird Brian Eno sounds coming, and I'd, I'd sit in with people, and then I'd have them come record their song, and I'd do some of that work. And some of that, that stuff um, is how the original kind of rotoscope lineup happened. Um, we, I was living with the bass player, and, and then that kind of group, Started, we brought in a couple other people and kind of just it was like a rotating cast of characters. But uh, Courtney uh, Todeshek, now Courtney Brown, uh, who wrote about half these songs on the record, you know, she was um, she was a singer songwriter and we did a couple jams together. And then eventually I had my original rotoscope lineup and we had this different kind of band uh, and we basically just merged them together and that kind of all that material came to one. Uh, so that was kind of how I got started with production, just learning with the Digio One and, you know, no really no outboard gear, a couple plugins, just but just get a good mic or two and, and see what you can do. Yeah, wow, amazing. And like what are you doing these days? Like what is what does production look like for you these days? Uh production's a lot different. <laughs> um <laughs> twenty years of acquiring hardware and and uh knowledge really, knowledge and experience. Um I've been doing most of the stuff I do now I'm uh I'm out at a on a farm in Charlottesville and I will have people Sometimes they come over and I work through an album with them. Um, we did that with Kelsey Henry, and she showed up with singer-songwriter songs again, and we built out the record. Uh, I do a lot of work with Isaac Wardell and Bifrost Arts. Uh, we co-produced a record called Lamentations, a Christian record about two, it's more than two years ago now. Uh, and then often I'll, I'll get people send me a track, hey, could you play on this? So I just did four jams for a gentleman named Josh Garrels. 
uh, just doing kind of my guitar and some synth stuff. So going in and layering the DX7 and the Nord and all these things and kind of making these textures uh, and sending it back. And, and you know, I've, I've never met Josh in person. You know, it's just like one of those like, hey, you know, do this and back and forth and record comes out and I've got it on vinyl. I think it's the first thing actually I've ever played on that was printed to vinyl. So I've got definitely, <laughs> definitely have that in the, the life, living room. Life goals. Achieved. Total life goals. Total life goals. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's, I mean, I've, I've uh, over the years I've upgraded to a Digio 2 and then I finally got an HDX system um, a couple years back. Um, and then again, people I've worked with, you'd be like, hey, I've got this piece of gear I'm selling. Do you want it? And you know, I, I was working, you know, working in the tech scene a lot. And so I had pretty good income for a while. And I would just be like, yeah, sure, I'll buy that. Sure, I'll buy that. And now I have a pretty decent uh, accumulation of rack gear that's hidden behind me. Yeah, I mean, I could see all, I could also see all your synths behind you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. Wall mount. Awesome. Is, did, did you have like an aha moment when you realized, I'm going to be doing this music thing for the long haul? Probably in high school. But it was, it was, uh, I, I definitely when I realized that I could get the guitar to do what I wanted it to do and make weird soundscapes and things like that, I didn't think, you know, I thought I could be a singer and I realized that I wasn't very good at being a front person. I can do it, but it's not my strong suit. My strong suit is definitely more of the guitar and the texture. That's where my interest lies. I am not one of those great performers where you can just give me a song and I'm out there. I have to really work at that side of things. But um, that plus the kind of management mentality uh, I had a, a booking agent tell me once, he's like, you're never going to make it as a musician. You're going to be a band manager because you're too focused on that. Um, <laughs> didn't it, I, I, I don't think that's true because I, was, I, was, I had to. There was no other choice. You're a high school band. Who's, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> um, but that's just, that's just like a recipe to, to be successful as an artist right. like today in like 2020, right? You just got to focus on like the management aspect. And, and it's, it's also partnering with people that, that are really good at doing something else that you're not good mm. at. Um, but yeah, I think it was definitely in the high school. I was like, I, I always, I mean, you have that, yeah, I'm going to be a rock star. Woo! And, you know, but I think the reality of that, you know, changes as you get older. And it's more like, I just like to play music with my friends, but it's something where you're still doing it. And um, I mean, with Juniper, Juniper Lane, we were, you know, in honor of August, uh, we were touring up and down the East Coast. Um, you know, so it's, it, you know, we did pretty well for a regional band for the states you know the the market had changed dramatically by the time i was doing that and we had all kind of gotten to the reality of we're probably not going to get signed you know in the sense of like the traditional thing because that that just didn't exist anymore but it's definitely you know getting to put out the songs playing big shows things like that that was definitely i think that's when we realized yep we checked that box we're good Wow. So, so tell me a bit about your, your, your moniker, uh, Rotoscope. Like, could you dive into what exactly is this project and, and what are you doing? Sure. So the name comes from an old animation tool. Um, if you think about Snow White, for example, uh, it was a rear projection thing that they would trace frame by frame. So to get a woman to walk naturally in the cartoon, they actually traced a real woman walking and then animated over it. Uh, so there was this kind of idea, and <clears throat> pardon me. And Rotoscope these days talks about if you're if you're in visual effects, it's about roto. It's one of the least pleasurable jobs, but it's um, you're like knocking things, <laughs> knocking things out frame by frame, and putting them in another thing, or slipping things behind them, things like that. So that we we definitely kind of thought Phil Golub and uh, came up with the name. Uh, one of the, he, he was the original keyboard sax player in the band, and he came up with the name, and we really thought that's really cool. It kind of works with what we do. We kind of break things up, reassemble them and move some stuff around. Um, and so a lot of these things we started that, that original lineup played a lot from say 99 to 2004. Um, the, the two original, like that kind of version where we merged together and that, like the original group of four guys. And then we kind of just started working on the record and we had, um, I was sitting in with Junior Berlain at the time on keyboards and then, uh, Fred, Brian Frederick, the bass player from Juniper Lane, would come over to our rehearsals and help us work through some songs. And he started playing bass in the rehearsals as well. And we kind of rearranged the entire catalog. Um, and that's where those, that's what, what you're hearing on the record is really kind of a snapshot of that 2004, 5, 6 era rearrangement. <clears throat> a lot of things were changed, you know, as you, you go through, you know, and you, you, you hear something you recorded in 2004 and 2010, you're like, mm, got to change that. That's a little dated. But that's really how that kind of evolved quickly at that point. And it, we've just been working on it intermittently ever since. You know, in, in come, uh, 2005, I had joined Honor by August and was out on the road playing bass for them. Um, 
And then by and then 2007, I left Honor by August, and and Junior Berlain asked me to come on board full time for guitar and synth, which I had been sitting in with, which is my primary focus. <clears throat> and the you know the rotoscope record just kind of sat in the background, and we worked on it here and there. At a point, I think we finally just said, "Okay, we're good enough," and we sent it down. Paul David Hager did a bunch of the mixes on it. This is the EP that you released. <clears throat> now, this is kind of all the material was all done at the same point. Um, so, like all these songs were kind of put together, recorded at the same time, and then we've released. You know, the EP first is kind of a tease. The, the covers were actually done last. Um, uh, our engineer Rich Stein out of Richmond did did the mixes on those. Um, but those are two songs that I I just love both of the, those artists Peter Gabriel and uh, Credit House and just wanted to just you know, I I had kind of messed around with those one of those like you know I'm, you're sitting there playing around oh I should record this song and see how it sounds I don't know if other people do that too but it, it's yeah, it's kind of a sure. way to dissect the song from a songwriting perspective but then also understand like oh that's how they produce that cool thing um, and like the Fall at Your Feet is dramatically different than the the original the original's up more up tempo it's got the the bass moving all throughout which is you know that's just one of those crowded house things that's so i don't know he's he's an amazing bass player that no one seems to realize and have to check him out but this is just like i was like i i have this unit which is a korg a3 uh it's a rack space and um and it's it's kind of the era like the the late 90s or actually no mid 90s i think early 90s maybe even it's it's kind of vintage <laughs> now um a lot of the Zuropa sounds were from that unit, from from the Edge, from U two. Mm. So there's really digital weird sounds, but it has a triple delay in there, and if you bow it with a cello bow, it's like instant Seeger Rose. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just playing around with that, and I'm like, oh, you could do Fall at Your Feet, like kind of in a really slow version. I did like three or four of these songs that were kind of like these slowed down dirges. I don't know if that's the right word, but, um, one of them, that's the weirdest thing ever is the, uh, it's not on this record. It's, um, um, dance, dance by fallout boy of all things. It's literally taken in about half time, which is kind of a play on the lyric. We're falling apart in half time. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's called the shoegazer Baptist revival. Cause it's just all foot stomps and claps and, and like, just like weird pedal tones and things like that. So that's, I mean, it's just kind of like you, you kind of experiment on things like that that are almost throwaways. They're just like, oh, this is fun, and I can just post it on SoundCloud or if, you know, who cares? And, and, and you kind of say, oh, that was a really cool idea. I want to use that tone over here now in this song that I really care about. Yeah. How do you maintain the, uh, the focus to work on, on a track for so many years and just like, like slowly like bit, you know, bits and pieces until, until you have like a record? Like how do you maintain that? Well, there's there's a way there's a point where you definitely say I give up, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, this uh, I went to architecture school and and uh, one of the quotes I always remember from one of my teachers is that projects are never finished they're simply abandoned, and I think that right. rings true in in music as well as building, and some of, some of them are like I don't know what else I could add and I definitely don't want to take anything else away so I think that's done. Um, and with some of them, like a lot of, for example, uh, one day is a good example of that track. We, we, uh, you know, we finished that pretty early on. That was one of the first six that we did, uh, that were, were kind of like, we said, that's a wrap. And we went back to those six and, and did a lot of updates and added a lot of synth parts. Cause it just, it didn't, it kind of felt disconnected from the newer stuff that had gotten more rearrangement and more textures created as we went along. <clears throat> so coming back and saying, oh, here, let's add in some little parts and let's take away some of the older stuff. There were a lot of stacked kind of just power chord guitars that definitely went by the wayside and were replaced more with analog synth sounds, like with the with the Poly 6 stacked with the Nord and things like that, just kind of getting the, replacing the texture of just that distorted guitar with, you know, kind of the, the, the grit of the analog synth. So it's the same intent, but it sounds and feels a lot different. It feels a lot more, oh, this is this is more technical, the digital vibe to it nice what's your vision for the for the record like what's your goal i mean like, sonically just, yeah oh, sorry sonically. sonically okay so for me it's i have visuals that i kind of associate with everything and so the record to me feels like driving around dc at like 2 a.m there's just kind of this like there's definitely a a, a longing to it um and i think part of it was you know finishing these songs is certainly one of those things whenever this kind of goes back to the last question too whenever something's sitting out there and I haven't yet said done, like it's done. I released it. It's done, done. So if I come back to it now, I'm like the police doing my update to a song, but it's, it was released. It's still like, Oh, I could tweak this. Oh, I could change that. 